Welcome to this edition of Let's Talk About It. My guest today is none other than Miss Esther Renee Daniels. <laughs> Esther, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I appreciate it. Yeah, and we are glad to have you. Now, you have a very interesting testimony. I want to start off by saying this is your book. It's called What's Under Your Rug. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a very interesting title. Yes. What's Under Your Rug. And I'm certain that everybody have different things under their rug. Yes. What inspired you to write this book? Well, it was really weird. I was at a, a women's Bible study, and there was a lady there. She was a guest as an author, and I kept thinking the whole time, sitting there thinking, you know, you need to write a book, you need to write a book. And I walked out there like, you know, you really got jokes son. I ain't got nothing to say. What do I have to say? Mm -hmm. And so it kept coming, kept coming. And so finally I, I asked God, if you really want me to write this book, could you at least tell me what you want me to write about? Because I have no clue. <laughs> and so later, not long after that, uh, this title came, What's Under Your Rug? Yeah. And I thought, hmm, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. So I started writing some stuff, just, just kind of messing with it. And it dawned on me that in order to prove what I'm talking about, I had to tell some stuff about myself. Yeah. And I thought, wait a minute, God, that, that wasn't part of the deal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I had already started. Right, right. So I went on and did it as a result of, of God giving me the title first uh -huh. and the information later. Wow. Okay, now, with what's under your rug, I want to go back to something that was under your rug. Okay. Uh, in your childhood. Mm -hmm. Now, from what I've read here, you were actually molested. Yes. Uh, at what age? Ah, uh, elementary school. What, eight, nine? Elementary school. And that certainly affected the course of your life. Yes. And your life experiences. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit of what that was like for you at that time. Well, as a child, and I, I by not knowing <clears throat> anything about sex at the time, <clears throat> I really didn't realize that it was something wrong. Okay. I, I, I thought what I had what had happened was something that I allowed mm -hmm. to happen to me. And so I lived in fear of people finding out about it for a long time. And uh, so finally, I don't know how many times it happened, but I know it happened over s several years and a okay. few times. Okay. That the lady who did this lived down the street from my grandmother. And so finally, I, I, I knew it was wrong, or it felt wrong. And so I went to my grandmother and asked her, was it true what she told me, the girl told me, mm -hmm. was that girls supposed to be with girls, and she wanted to show me how that was. Okay. And so uh, I asked my grandmother about that, and of course she wanted to know where I got that from. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't remember what I said about that to her, but she did tell me what her idea of that was. Right. And, and so then I really felt bad, because now I haven't told her still what, what prompted What's really going on. Yes. Yeah. And so I lived in fear for uh, most of my life, most of my teen life, my adult life, because I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. And so I didn't tell anyone about that incident um, until I was 28. And I remember the relief that I felt when the person said to me, do you realize that you were violated? Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I, I, I let her do that to me. And she said, no, you were violated. There was no way for you to let someone older than you do that to you. Mm -hmm. You don't, you know, so she explained it. But it gave me some freedom. Yeah. And really looking at myself in a different way. Uh, it took a lot of practice to get back to knowing that I'm really okay. I'm this. I'm not this bad, ugly girl. Um, I'm. I'm really okay. Yeah. And so it took me a long time, but um, that story took me into a lot of different areas in life. That uh, drugs, um, just trying to kill me. Yeah. All of that. Yeah. Which uh, is another thing I wanted to talk about mm -hmm. the uh, the drug addiction. Yes. Uh, that was a derivative of what had happened yes. in your past. Mm -hmm. Now, how long were you actually addicted? I started using, well, I took my first drink when I was eight, 13, 13. Okay. And uh, from that point, it was just, you know, when they have parties and you sneak your mom and them drink and stuff like right, that. Right, right. I but think we I, all did that. Yeah, I think everybody yeah. did that. <laughs> but when I turned 18, before it became 21, when mm -hmm. I turned 18, I was like a drinking fool. I mean, I could drink legally. Uh, I would go out and get drunk. I mean, it was just horrible. And and eventually, I went from drinking to doing harder drugs. Uh, okay. Someone introduced me to speed because I was always trying to be skinny, and then that's <laughs> <laughs> and that speed uh, turned into an addiction. Okay. Uh, it was more than just about uh, losing weight. It was it became a way of feeling 
-hmm. and and once I started doing drugs it took me out of that place of having to think about the molestation having to think about being raped having to think about there's a lot of things that happened after you're basically self-medicating yourself I did with these things I did and so that I eventually made it to bigger drugs uh, uh, (coughs) cocaine and uh, uh, acid and okay and things like that didn't make it to heroin thank God somebody yeah. tried to introduce me to it I was scared of needles mm, good thing you were scared of needles <laughs> yeah. that saved you, <laughs> yes, you know, sometimes did. fear is good yes you know uh, <laughs> and, and fear can oftentimes save us from a lot of things that can uh, certainly cause issues in our lives yeah you know uh, at your lowest point with your addiction do you recall what your lowest point was oh. yes indeed <clears throat> I, I, as a matter of fact, it's really funny you bring it up because I was looking at, thinking about that the other day. I, um, I remember at the very end, I was living in Los Angeles and it was mm, about midnight, mm-hmm. somewhere between midnight and 6 a.m. And I was walking uh, in near, um, I don't even know what this area is called now, but it's near, uh, it's off of Prairie and Central. It's not a really good area. It's where the horse races and things are. Okay. <clears throat> but the horse races wasn't there when I when I did it, when mm-hmm. this was going on. Okay. Anyway, I um was walking and <clears throat> and I kept thinking, I, I need what I need. I'm trying to find somebody to sell me I didn't even have no money. I don't okay. know what I thought I was gonna do. Yeah, but you just wanted but the job. I, but I was want yeah, I wanted what I wanted. And I was walking trying my best to hope somebody would talk to me to ask me what I wanted. Yeah. Nobody would talk to me, nobody messed with me, and I just kept walking hoping somebody would ask me what I, what am I doing out here yeah and so finally nobody paid me any attention and I just went back home and the reason why that's a big story for me is because God I believe God saved me that night mm. because it was it was a lot of people out and and it wasn't a neighborhood that you need to be walking in yeah and I just believed that God saved me from that and so but what I did was later on I, I decided well I'm gonna drive somewhere Okay. So I drove to this place and um, I I did get something. Mm-hmm. And as I was coming out of the house, this was the last night I used. As I was coming out of the house, I saw the cops sitting down the street, and I thought, Oh Lord, I'm going to jail <laughs> in L.A. I don't know nobody. So I get in the car and I'm trying to hide my drugs. Right. And and it and I passed the cops up because I kept talking to myself, Don't turn around. You they gonna know that's obvious. Just keep going. So I passed the cops up, and I, as I passed them, I heard myself say, this is sad. Even if you had a chance to throw this out, you're not going to even do it. Yeah. And so I looked up through the sunroof of my car, and I just said, God, please help me. Mm-hmm. So as I turned the corner, the cops turned with me, and we ended up on the side of each other. And I, I just said, accept the fact I'm going to jail. Right. So right. I looked at them, and they looked at me, and I was like, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> and um, they drove off. Mm. And I would like to tell you that I threw that away. And went, no, I went home and did what I had to do with what I bought. Yeah. <laughs> could not get high. I don't care how much dope I smoked, I could not get high. And so I kept saying, he must sell me some bad dope or whatever, but I could not get high. And so the next morning, my, my roommate told me that she needed me to move out because uh, she knew I was getting high. And she had already saw her brother die of an overdose of heroin and, um, and uh, cocaine. Mm. And she didn't want to see me die. Yeah. So she put me out, so I was now homeless in Los Angeles, um, an addict, and uh, trying to get it together. And I ended up, and I told her, I said, well, I'm going to go to meetings, I'm going to go to meetings. And I ended up going to Cocaine Anonymous and um, thinking she was going to let me move, not be put out. Right, right. I was still put out. And so <laughs> I, she did put me out, and I ended up going to meetings, and that was March the 3rd, uh, 1988. Okay, March of 3rd, 1988. March 3rd, 1988, I went to my first meeting, and I've been sober ever since. Uh, I was homeless, but I went to sober living. Wow. And she's been sober ever, ever since. And actually, that, that period has been a tw- 26, 26 years? 26 years. Yeah, 26 years. She's been sober for 26. That is mm-hmm. quite a feat. Yeah. To be sober for 26 years. We, I can't wait to hear more of your story. We're going to be back in just a moment with more. Let's talk about it. You guys stick around for more of Esther. Yeah. try to 
to step beyond this point, I have no problem with you. As long as you remain in your place, I have no problem with you. As long as you stay under me, I have no problem with you. But you bet not step forward. Oh, I wish I had. See, y'all, y'all missing it. Y'all, y'all missing it. You, see, see, that's the thing about it is that is that folk are happy as long as you are where you are. back to this edition of Let's Talk About It, where my wonderful guest is none other than Esther Daniels. Esther, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm having a great time. I'm having a great time myself. You know what? When we left off, you we were talking about your addiction mm -hmm. and the things that you had ex experienced. Now, from the addiction yes. and from those experiences, you ended up doing something. You wrote the book. I did. Number one. Mm -hmm. Then you became a counselor. I did. I did. For substance abuse and people that are going through stuff. And that's when you make your life count. Mm -hmm. When you're going through something, and then you can turn that into an experience that can bless somebody else. Mm -hmm. Because what we go through, we never go through it just for ourselves. That's but it's right. always about blessing and helping somebody else. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I want to commend you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I know that took courage just to do that. Well, you know what? I'm pretty transparent, <coughs> right? Um, but I have to admit that I didn't intentionally want to be a, a, a substance abuse counselor. I... I I worked for a major investment firm at the time, and we had reimbursement for education. So okay. I got my master's degree in psychology, and I thought one day when I retired, and I'll just probably do some counseling and supplement my income, right. and I got laid off. Mm -hmm. And so God said, no, we're going to do this now. Mm. And so I, I, the only job I could find was <laughs> an internship for substance abuse. Okay. Way in Baytown, mm -hmm. and I drove all the way to Baytown every day for two, like every day for two years, mm. as an intern. And I finally got all my hours together and became a licensed chemical dependency counselor. But I didn't want to do that, and I and I was praying. I'm like, God, I don't want to do this. And God said, How are you going to turn down the only job that's being offered to you? Wow, that's the only one that's being offered. You don't have a choice. I was like, okay. So I went in reluctantly and found out that's exactly where I was supposed to be. Yeah. Exactly where I was supposed to be. And the only reason why I didn't want to do it, let me just make that clear, it wasn't because I didn't want to give back. Mm -hmm. It was because at one point when, when substance abuse was becoming a big deal, people were becoming licensed uh, chemical dependency counselors. Just everybody was doing it. Okay. And I didn't want to do what everybody was doing. Right. And so I said, I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. I don't care how much time I got. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and God said, yeah, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. Well, this was years later, and I think that this was the perfect time for it because yeah. uh, now people are looking at mental health and substance abuse in a whole different light. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know what, too? Um, what makes you good is the fact that you, you can relate to those people. Yeah. Because of your own personal experience. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between you and somebody that's just getting a license mm -hmm. to do this as a job. You, when they come through those doors, you can actually identify yes. with them. And they don't know who I am. Yeah. They just think, oh, she, she don't look like she did a drug in her life. Yeah. And when, I, when they start trying to, like, send me down the, down the sea with some stuff that ain't good, mm -hmm. I let them have it. And I believe that. <laughs> yeah. I believe that. I believe that. I let them have it. Because I know it. off camera, just a minute ago, we were just playing. You were letting me have it. Oh. So, I mean, I, I, I believe you were letting them have it, too. I let them have it just like I let you have it. That, that's, that's, what right. that's right. That's right. That's what I believe. Now, 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 tell me this here. You know I'm having fun with you. I know. I love it. <laughs> okay. Now, you also started Titus Works. I did. I and, did. you know, a lot of times, oh, let me say this. A lot of times, God gently nudges us in the direction that he wants us to go in. Mm -hmm. When we talked about you becoming a substance abuse counselor, you said, oh, I don't really want to do that. You're looking for a job, whatever. I want to do something different. But God closed the doors. Mm -hmm. He sure did. But he left one door open. And that was the door that he wanted you to walk through. That's right. And, uh, that takes you into your destiny. Mm -hmm. And not only into your destiny, but it also blesses the destiny of those that come through those doors that you help. Yeah. That you not only sympathize with, but you can empathize with those people mm -hmm. as well because of your experience. Now, Titus works. 
Titus Works is something else that you've started. Yes. Tell us a little bit about Titus Works. Well, Titus Works is, was, was it started out as, well, let me, I had to start from the beginning. The begin, how Titus Works came into existence was I met a lady who was actually my aunt's best friend. Okay. And so she is a was a seamstress, and she made these awesome lap scarves and, and for church. And so I would go and buy lap scarves from her in Beaumont, which is where I'm from. Okay. And so I traveled to Beaumont, and one day I went to Beaumont to go buy uh, lap scarves, and she was ill. And we talked about it, and I asked her, could I pray for her? And I did. And yeah. she uh, explained to me that she had been in remission from breast cancer, mm -hmm. and that now it was back at stage four. Mm -hmm. So after that, I started going just to spend time with her, but buying lap scarves too, because she had beautiful lap scarves. <laughs> and so uh, finally, she was it was ill of even more, and her family called and asked if I would come back and pray for her again, and I did. So I got an opportunity to talk with her before she died. And she did die not long after that. And her family then called me again and asked if I would speak at her funeral, which was amazing to me because they didn't have, they could have chose anyone, mm -hmm. but they did, they asked me, and which was an honor. So in studying for to speak at her funeral, God led me to Titus chapter two. Okay. And it talks about in Titus chapter 2 how we're mandated to give back to the people who are coming behind us so that they can see what an ordained life that God would afford us to live should live. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how we should model goodness for those, those behind us so that they can try to live this lifestyle. Not that we have to be perfect, but that we need to model the kind of goodness that God would ordain. Yeah. So... Um, after that, after I talked at her funeral about her being my tightest friend, because that's exactly what she did for me. She okay. modeled goodness. Uh, she used to bake uh, those little mini potato pies and tea mm. cakes and mm. stuff like that. And I get there, she have all this stuff laid out for mm. me. And we sit at her table and talk and share. And so uh, on my way back from her funeral, God placed on my heart how many other people in the world who may not have ever experienced a relationship with someone that they could just sit down and be who they were yeah. and ask whatever they wanted to ask. And that's what she did for me. Wow. And I thought, God, how could I give that to somebody? Mm. And he, he talked, had this ministry in my mind and I talked to some women that I mentor and we came up with the, with the name Titus Works because it works if we do what we're mandated to do. Yeah. And so we created this ministry. We didn't know how it was going to be, but uh, my friend Michelle Harden uh, helped brand it. And she asked, had I ever thought about doing a conference call? We did the conference call, and that was uh, November 16, 2010. And we're okay. still in existence today. And so on, in November, it'll be four years old. Wow. Yeah. Great. 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 <laughs> you know, it's, it's so good when you, you know, like the, the word speaks from him starting a good work in you. Mm -hmm. And you're taking that good work to another level. Mm. And it's always about making a difference in the lives of those that you can impact mm -hmm. because of your circumstances, because yes. of your situation. You know? I was reading some of your information. You talked about renting one room. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about renting one one room, not a house, not an apartment, but one room. One room. We know. You heard the birds chirping mm -hmm. outside. I liked what I read that was attached to that. I love When that. I read that about you. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, someone had asked me what was my greatest memory, and I was thinking about it. And I thought, well, it could be that my memory of, of being with my grandmother as she was making cake from scratch right. and give you the bowl afterwards. And left a little bit in there for you to have a little yeah. extra. Yeah. It could have been yeah. that. Or it could be when I got my bachelor's degree after 20-something years of trying to get it, actually trying to quit, but God wouldn't let me. Mm. Uh, or it could have been when I wrapped across the stage again to get my master's degree and never thought I would even have a bachelor's degree, degree rather than a master's. Yeah. And uh, But I, what it really is is the day after getting sober and I was in my one room on a really beautiful Saturday morning, sitting on the side of the bed, and I could hear the birds singing outside my window. Yeah. And it reminded me of life and how, ugh, and how God didn't have to bless me with life. Yeah. A second chance at life. And I had not ever heard the birds before that because all I could hear, even in the daytime, there were no birds singing in my life. It was always dark. And what I did hear instead of the birds was death. Mm. And so that day, I no longer heard death, yeah. but I heard life. 
And so I, I think that that's my greatest memory. And whenever I hear birds sing today, I re it reminds me of life and how I should always choose life. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. Man, we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we come back in just a moment. With more of let's talk about it with my guest, Esther Daniels. Okay, so I'm going to push. Of Let's Talk About It with my guest, Esther Daniels. Yes. For those of you that have, might have just joined us, we've been talking to Esther about uh, a former addiction um, that she's certainly overcome very triumphantly uh, to even write a book called What's Under Your Rug. And you know, so many different people have so many different things that are under their rug. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times we're healed when we're able to snatch that rug up yes. and deal with what's under mm. that rug, mm -hmm. um, like you've done, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted to ask you, based on your past experience and what you know, being uh, that you're former, a former drug addict, mm -hmm. that you've dealt with that in life, what type of advice would you give to someone else that you see in the same situation? Well, in that situation, even if, if they're using and they don't have a desire to stop, there's really nothing you can say. Okay. It really isn't, because I could talk to them and tell them all the good stuff I think I know, but if they're not willing and not ready, they're not going to hear it. Yeah. Uh, but I wouldn't, I, I'd tell them what I could. But if it's somebody that's really seeking a way out, then I would certainly ask them, you know, are they willing to go into treatment? Are they willing to do outpatient? Somebody needs to assist them through that, because it's not a matter of just waking up one day. Well, let me say, for me, it wasn't a matter of just waking up one day and deciding, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do this no more. You know, so I, I needed help to not do that. Okay. And to be accountable to right. not do it. Uh, so I didn't have a way out to say, you know what, it ain't working for me today, so I'm just going to go back to what I know. Mm. I had people that I, would be, I was being accountable to. Okay. So I would tell them that they need a support system. Right. They need a support system. And in that support, it needs to be some type of tools given to them to be able to say no when they need to say no. Mm -hmm. But you can't say no to pain if you don't do anything about it. And that's what the book is about. Yeah. If you don't, and, and I hate when people say, oh, baby, don't forget the past. Just forget the past. Yeah. I wish we could just forget the past. It's not that simple. No, it is not that simple. Um, if you don't even look at the past, if you just don't even look at it, it is making decisions for you. It is stopping you from interacting with people. It is the thing that's telling you, don't go to that party or don't go to that event because yeah. you're going to walk in and you're going to look stupid. It is the, mm -hmm. the that thing inside of you that tells you, that's not your, she shouldn't be your friend. You don't know nothing about her. She's, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it stops you from, it, it, it really controls how you interact in your life. All that stuff that you thought was under the rug, nobody could see it. It's right. not, it's there. Right. And it's showing through everything you do. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I had a cousin who read the book, and when he read it, he called me and said, I got so much stuff under my rug, I think I'm just going to get up under it and just stay with it and, mm -hmm. and just suck my thumb and be up under that rug. <laughs> he said, it's just too much stuff. Yeah. But, but you can't expect to go under and sweep everything out of the rug all in one day. Yeah. It's going to take a process, and yeah. that's where people miss it. Mm -hmm. They don't want to do the work. Yeah. And oftentimes, to do the work, you have to deal with certain pains. You do. Yes. That you, have you to. And, and, and a lot of times, we're just not ready to deal with that pain. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, until we deal with that pain, uh, we can't recover. We can't heal. Mm -hmm. We can't move on to that next place that God has yes. for us. Yes. Um, so when you look at all the stuff under the rug, unless you're willing to deal with all the stuff under the rug, it stays there. It stays. You, and, and something you said a minute ago, you said, when I ask you, what advice would you give to somebody else mm -hmm. who's in the situation? Who, uh, and you said that you would have, uh, if they were ready. Yes. And it's funny that you should say that because in talking to other people that are going through recovery, mm -hmm. they said the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. You can beat someone over the head who's a drug addict. You can call them every day, see how they're doing, da-da-da. <laughs> but unless they are ready, mm -hmm. 
it's not going to change. That's right. And a lot of times it takes a rock bottom situation in order for that change to take place in their and, lives. And everybody's bottom is going to look different. Yes. My bottom not, may not look like somebody else's bottom. I mm -hmm. may not have had to go to the depths that someone else went right. to. And so when people call me, and I get a lot of calls about my child is this or my daughter, you know, somebody I know, if the person's not calling me, it does no good for the person that's in the disease. Mm. You can call me and tell me about your person. Right. But if that person, if you need to have that person call me. Yeah. I'm not calling them. You don't need to call them and put them on three-way. Mm -hmm. They need to dial right. them. Because mm -hmm. if they don't, do they really want help? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And in order for you to really get the help that you need, you have to make that call. You do. You have to show that you can stand in the midst of all the craziness that's mm -hmm. going on in your life. And you know what, oh, it's so funny because, it, and this is going to sound really crazy, but who am I to stop your using if mm. you ain't ready? Because if I stop you when you're not ready, right, you try to stop now, all you're doing is going back to the vomit at some point mm -hmm. and start all over mm. again. So I don't need to stop your process. You need to just go and do what you got to do. Right. And when you're ready, again, you yeah. will make that call to somebody. Yeah. So we, I'll pray for you. Yeah. Certainly. But I can't make you change. Yeah. And the thing is, when you're not ready, mm -hmm. and it delays the process. It does. It does. Because you just go back to it, mm -hmm. and it's repeated. Repeated all over again. Nothing different. Nothing hurting, new. Hurting more people. <clears throat> hurting the people who was trying to help you. Yeah. You know, just it just adds more fuel to the fire. It does. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it does. It really does. That's exactly what it does. Well, I'm glad that you were able to clean what's under your rug. Thank you. I am, too. And because you were able to do that, so many people are being blessed now. Not only when they get to hear you speak. And speaking of this, okay, yes. let's get to that. Speaking. Yes. Now, tell me about your speaking engagements, because you actually speak to people through your your foundation mm -hmm. called Titus Work. I do. In order to bless them. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I've, been had, I've had the opportunity to <coughs> speak to a lot of people. Um, usually when I go out and speak, I, I just came back from Chicago speaking at an event called I Am a Pearl. And it was amazing because my, my workshop was on dealing with the past. Okay. And I, I was able to work with some women who were dealing with some issues in their past. Yeah. And, and the, re the reviews from them was amazing. So I love going out to speak. I pray that I get more speaking engagements to be able to help people see that this is a lifestyle you really don't have to live. Right. You can choose to do something different, even in the midst of it. It's going to be painful, it's not going to be easy, but we can fix it. Yeah. But you got to at least want to do that. And I think that by me speaking in public places, it opens a door for somebody to consider yeah. the change. Yeah. Because they at least know somebody staying sober. Mm -hmm. It worked for somebody. Right. So if I don't know how to do nothing else, I can talk about being sober. There you go. I can do that. But I can talk about God, too, because I love God. So. All right. He yeah. got you through all of this. Yes, he did. Now, I want to ask you for more information about... Titus Works mm -hmm. and Esther Daniels, how can people find out more about you? Well, I can be reached on Facebook for sure. All I have to do is look for Esther Renee Wright Daniels. I just put Esther in there. I'm sure she'll come up. <laughs> There's also a page for Titus Works. And I have a, a devotional page called Journey Model Goodness. Uh, that I'm also creating a, a journey, a devotional book okay. that I'm hoping to be out in a couple of months. So it's going to be called Journey Model Goodness, so they can okay. reach me there. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, Twitter, my handle on Twitter is uh, at Model Goodness. And Instagram is Titus Works. And I think that's it. Well, you know what? If it ain't, <laughs> it, it, it's enough. <laughs> it, they ought to be close to enough for somebody to get in touch with Sister Dan. <laughs> With all the twitting and the, the, yes. the, the Instagram and the Facebook, y'all got all the information y'all yeah. need. I have a website too. Oh. The website is www.titus, the number two, okay. empower.com. Okay, say it one more time. www.titus, the number two, empower.com. Titus to empower. All right. So you guys have all the information on Ms. Daniels. For more information on this show, you can certainly reach us at Let's Talk About It 12 TV at gmail.com. That's Let's Talk About It 12 TV at gmail.com. You can also find me on the YouTube channel. Just simply type in Let's Talk About It and Feral Phelps. You get a list of all of our shows right there. All right. Until next time, folks, we'll see you then. <laughs>